All right, we'll get started. We have um, today an exciting presentation on going the last mile in Malawi. But first, I'd like to just introduce Open Team, the open technology ecosystem for ag agricultural management. Um, so Open Team is a project uh, based out of the foundation for out of Wolf's Neck Center for Agriculture and the Environment, funded through the Foundation for Food and Ag Research and partners such as Stonyfield Organic and about 30 plus members at this stage. Um, so our goal with this series is really to build the knowledge base of our members, our growing community, and in a way that fosters coherence and collaboration so that we can better serve our diverse membership. So you'll see how we can illustrate and document the dynamic nature of our community in support of community strengthening. And also um, you'll see today, I think the, by being inspired and through new concepts and technologies that enable the emergence of new collaborations and tech approaches. So today we have Sig Snap, professor uh, and soils and cropping systems ecologist at Michigan State also the Associate Director of the Center for Global Change in Earth Observations. Uh, Regis Chikowa, Chikowo, Assistant Professor of Agricultural Systems also at Michigan State and an Associate Professor at the University of Zimbabwe. And as well, we have Dan Taravest, uh, who is the co-founder of RSI, also I think has a background working with Michigan State. So without further ado, uh, I'll toss it over to the three of you. Um, we'll have about 45 minutes or less of, of pre presentation and then we'll open it up to some Q&A. Thanks everyone for being here and thank you very much for presenting the three of you. So your screen well, is ready. Okay, thanks very much. And I have the chat up on so that we can you know, this should be interactive, that would be great. Obviously there's also the time at the end, which we really appreciate, but you can put comments in the chat so we can get circle around to them, that'd be great. So it's really an honor to be part of Open Team and we really appreciate Fafar and Wolf um, yeah, Creek to, you know, basically for providing all this support, we couldn't do it without you. And RSI you'll be seeing is one of these wonderful, innovative uh, folks kind of, uh, pioneering new ways to work together with scientists and farmers. And uh, Dr. Diamond Kembewa is in Malawi with his student, Mithiko, which I've mentioned here as actually part of our team because their goal really in Malawi is to try and transform extension to be more farmer centric, which I think is so admirable. And we've tried to be part of that effort. So this is really coming out of 20 years work in Malawi. And I think we have some really some exciting new results. So great to share them with you, but just to look back through history for a little bit, extension in Malawi, this small country at the bottom of the Rift Valley in Southern Africa, as in many former British colonies, there was a focus in the fifties before independence on master farmers. And that even continued in the sixties and seventies this idea that a few farmers can transform themselves into entrepreneur master farmers. And you see this motif come up other times. In fact, there's kind of a more recent iteration called lead farmers, but there's very much a technology transfer approach. So think about technology transfer. What does that mean? In fact, often underlying all of what we do in research is about we researchers will transfer this technology to you farmers and extension will your goal is to, and your job as some researchers would see it is to transfer it effectively. Recently, there's been more attention into farmer networks. This idea that farmers to peer, they listen a lot to other peers. They're, they're learning, talking to each other, can see at the top here, this idea of farmers as innovators that know their soils and try new things. So the farmers at the center there um, on the, Left, I have kind of a, a original, more of a top-down lead farmer or master farmer. And then on the right, this new idea, we can get hyper-local advice now to farmers. An extension can be then start a dialogue with farmers that's very farmer-centric. So this is the direction we're going. We're gonna try and explain how we see the open team approach 
um, and this farmer-centered extension, how it's playing out. And this is the historically, it's really important to, in the back of people's minds is often this idea that if we could just come up with better technologies and farmers, if they Hey, Sig, you got muted somehow. Thank you. I don't know if it was my computer. Let's see if we can get her back to- I Can't hear you, Sig. Can you undo her there, she's, Laura? She's muted. Yeah, I was muted by the host, so I don't know what happened. You You're back. <laughs> okay, okay so be careful with me accidentally, <laughs> even if you don't like what I'm saying. <laughs> um, okay, so, in Malawi, here's a typical extension recommendation around corn or maize, the main crop. So fertilizer is seen, it should be about 69 kilograms of nitrogen fertilizer everywhere in the country is the overall idea. Far, uh, farmers are supposed to take into account their recent history. So if they're using agroforestry or double up legumes or different rotations or compost, then they should reduce their fertilizer. So Cropping history is the only thing being taken into account here. And yet, I mean, it's a good effort. We there are trying to take into account this. But we know that if you look across a field or if you dig a hole and look at the profile, soils vary a lot. In fact, soils in Malawi vary from vertisols in one part of a farm. So along the drainage lines, very high organic matter to very low organic matter degraded alpha-sols and ultrasols typically. So how do we take into account this variation? Which an important point is this can be higher than regional or don't. So if you could figure out a recommendations, not for the whole country of Malawi, but for a region, you might think you're making progress. And yet within the same farm, we often see quite different levels of organic matter, which influences fertilizer performance particularly where we're talking small amounts of fertilizer in the tropics, organic matter is even a bigger role than in temperate and high input agriculture, I would contend. So we know that farmers often know their own soils fairly well. There's been a lot of work on indigenous soils. This is from Ghana showing that they may have a more detailed map and it may overlap in some ways with the soils, soil fertility map, but in fact, uh, it, how do we link these two? Farmers have knowledge. We need hyper-local knowledge, their own knowledge. But we also have information about soil carbon, which is a slow process, which is hard to observe. Some master farmers, I think, do observe it, but not all the farmers. So we have this learning lab in Malawi, which we've been supported by USAID and Africa Rising since 2013, which we're very grateful. Dr. Chiko runs this in Malawi, and it's a collaborative effort with many local universities, with uh, CG centers, at Grisat Siat, um, and we're you know really appreciative to be have had this time to interact with farmers. And I want to just say that handheld data gathering as open team often does is really, really important, but you also need to have this interactive time with farmers to fine tune it and uh, come up with technologies. What we often call a participatory or farmer oriented, sometimes it's called human design approach. So you plan together based on the literature and interaction with the farmers, see is there areas where your soil science or your market information, whatever you bring to the table, what's of interest to farmers, you act together so it's really important you test things and, and support farmers in testing things and then reflect. And then the observations and reflection are improved through these handheld devices. So we're collecting more data, but it should be part of a participatory action research. You wanna learn more about this. Um, I would just recommend looking at this Global Chain Science East Africa Node website. You can learn uh, some of what we've been learning in these last seven years together. Farmers, are experimenting all the time. And we're documenting some of that experimentation, just an example here of many different types of crop diversification, which again is very important for fine tuning fertilizer recommendations because the crop matters and the cropping history, as you saw. So in addition, we're using some remote sense data. So we're looking at both from satellites and from local. And this has allowed us to 
detect degradation trends, to learn where soil carbon influences fertilizer recommendations, for example. Here's some of the papers coming out of some of this work. But I wanted to just point out that this really detailed information is more and more being supported by RSI and other ODK uh, electronic survey approaches, that we can get more rapid turnaround, document information about farmer practices and get it to use in the synthesis and then also as a way to interact with local communities. So we could dive down all the way, not just to household information, as many panel, panel surveys, which basically means you keep going back to the same households. Sometimes these farmers may not know that they're signing up basically for being part of either an intervention group that we're giving them seeds and fertilizers and they try out, well, they use their own fertilizer, but then they try out different combinations. So some of the farmers are intervention farmers, but then we also have control farmers where we just observe once or twice a year. But we've also taken measurements of soil carbon. We try and understand active carbon and some other uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, other types of properties, soil texture. Some of our findings, this is what's now we're feeding back into recommendations through this participatory process. One of them is that if you have low soil carbon and particularly if you have striga, which is shown here in this red weed, it may look very small, but it has a very degrading effect. It is a parasite. If you add fertilizer to either of these situations, you will get no response of the corn. So it is useless to put that there. You have to rehabilitate your soil first. And so this is a hyper-local thing that you can either observe yourself, the striga, farmers often know if they have that side or not. Or if they could have a measure of soil carbon, uh, some fields don't have any striga, but they still have low soil carbon. So we've learned what is the threshold um, because we're seeing extraordinarily low fertilizer responses, less than eight kilograms grain. In fact, many of these sites were having one or two kilograms of grain for every kilogram of nitrogen fertilizer applied. Now on farm experiments, should we show that we could should be able to get 30 to 100. So these are orders of magnitude lower than it should be. Fertilizer is not working. And when we add zinc or phosphorus, that doesn't seem to be the problem. So there's something about the soil organic matter and rehabilitating. Unfortunately, if you use APSIS and even the new 30 meter resolution maps, so these are the soil grid data that you can download. Anyone can with smartphone. Unfortunately, it's very useful for some things and we use it in our algorithms to help update our data, but it is not useful and it was never claimed to be useful for soil fertility recommendations because you can see that the few farmers that have managed to improve their soil carbon, which are observed, we went and sampled soil carbon. So we know the actual gold standard soil carbon combustion, organic carbon, not carbonates. So we know the actual organic total carbon there. So you see a few farmers have managed to, even though they're in a degraded situation, hot, humid tropics or subhumid, but they've still managed to build their soil carbon. Yet this is not reflected. So basically the, the coarse grain nature of our data sets, which is you know, a big problem that many of you are aware of, this is a shared challenge as was been put in the chat. All right, so this is the problem. If we could go out and measure soil carbon for every farmer in Africa, and certainly in the US, this is more feasible. We, we just can't do that. And so what do we do? Well, this handheld reflectometer, which you'll learn more about the tech from um, Dr. Dan Tararvis. We're very fortunate to have our Sai, Greg Otusik and Dan Tararvis, who really worked side by side with us because they gave us earlier some photosync and some other types of measures. It just didn't provide us what we needed and it didn't work offline. They have worked on this until you can actually tell farmers a plus minus like approximately above or below a threshold. Is their soil carbon degraded too low or is it sufficient that, that they can now put fertilizer there? So we measure, we actually have been training this and developing the system with some thousand farmers. We wanted to see, could this be scalable? So what's unique here is that we didn't measure or go to these 595 farms in 2019 fall. No, we trained a few Malawi extension staff. They were given the reflectometers and given some recommendations to try to start a conversation with farmers. They went on their own to these farms, went to three fields per farm. And what did they do? They measured the soil carbon, 
once they were connected, then that data is then shared and, and uploaded. But even if they were offline and they couldn't get a good connection, which often happens, they were able to give feedback. This field is too low carbon. This field is better. And you could put your fertilizer, whatever spare, scarce resources you have in fertilizer, you could put here. You should rehabilitate. And they gave them options for rehabilitation. So they started a conversation based on this hyperlocal information, which we think is, is very useful. So is the data we gave them of any use? Well, if we'd used the maps that were available online at the time, we would have had very crude, there would have been no relationship. And in fact, often it would have underestimated. You can see that basically the current data, and it hasn't really changed with the upgrades, is at least in this part of Malawi, um, is a less, it's basically a smooth data. So it's less than 1.5. And yet actually some farmers are closer to three and they are have higher soil carbon, some fields. You have to take into account texture has been put in the chat. chat. So we use this I and mean, there'll be more technical information in a minute here, but I just wanna show you the range of estimated solar organic carbon based on this handheld visual. So so it's not the gold standard we know from the work of Keith Shepard and others that mid-range infrared really works well, but that's really expensive tech at the moment, as far as I know, it takes like $2,000 or even 20,000 in some of the um, bench tops. But these are $400, very cheap handholds. And so we were still able to then give recommendations or rather more importantly, I shouldn't say we, extension went to these farmers and told them uh, around 400 fields should be rotated because there's straga there. So that's a simple observation, doesn't need tech. Um, another 600, they shouldn't put any fertilizer on. They need to rehabilitate with compost or legume rotation, double up legumes, whatever works for them to the given options. And then there's another group over 600, almost 700 fields where there's enough carbon there. And we think that there should be a fertilizer response. And so they should put whatever scarce resource they have there. So. You can see the different types of maps. Um, again, the lab combustion is the gold standard. The APSIS didn't really help us that much. And the handheld reflectometer reflected pretty well, so to speak, reflected um, the lab combustion. So it tell you, this is in a village level. You can see fields that are a bit better and fields that are worse, crudely. Um, another point that we are working on is developing these products, these maps that then we could turn around and give back to a community so that then they could make decisions about where they should um, invest in rehabilitation, perhaps um, are there soil water conservation practices uh, such as buns, are they working or not? So this is more village level information that would be a product that we have not yet done, but we'd like to then start turning these around and also letting extension turn around to talk at the village level as well as these through farmer networks as well as individual farmers. So. This uh, tells you sort of examples of some of our, through the, through the participatory process, um, more than the reflectometer, this is what's guided the types of recommendations. So you'll notice that soil carbon is often high in clay sites. That's not surprising. Um, low uh, slope sites. Um, so if it's very steep, you often have low carbon. Interestingly, um, it's not just compost and crop diversity that increases soil carbon. So again, giving evidence that probably legumes and um, agroforestry or double up leggings is a way to improve your soil carbon. But weeds also in a lot of cases increased it. So perennial weeds, although they're a real disadvantage. So these are kind of the factors that, that tell you from Bayesian regressions and the variability around them that were related to soil carbon. Some are environmental and farmers can't change them like whether they're an area with high NDVI, which is so high net greenness, are they an area with high clay? Um, do they have a steep slope field? That's not much they can do about that, although they could implement soil conservation practices if it were, they were very sloped. But they can change things that also influence soil carbon, although not as dramatically, but still significantly, because anything on this side is positive. Um, crop diversity, is beneficial. So we're starting to see more and more evidence that legume diversity, even though it may not give us a lot of biomass, but it is giving us the roots that are building soil carbon, fitting with biogeochemistry knowledge, but now we're seeing it play out in real world. Farmers are not adopting conservation agriculture as yet in any of these sites, so we can't say anything about reduced disturbance. They're all making ridges, but some of them are trying diversity 
and look at the benefit. Some of them happen to have high amounts of weeds at the end of the season, perennial bushy weeds. Maybe it's just an agroforestry type thing, but it's informal and it maybe it causes downside in terms of competition, but it also is improving your soil carbon. So as we see more herbicide use, we have to be careful that we don't reduce the diversity so much from herbicides that we start having soil carbon problems being exacerbating them. So this kind of tells us what happens in the real world. We're not yet making recommendations based on this, but it just shows you how this participatory action research and these, um, these surveys are really providing us new insights um, at hyperlocal, what is happening in different locations. So we're not talking about just handhelds on their own, working with extension, working with this ongoing participatory research process, we're learning new insights. So where are we at next steps? We, we're gonna do a survey of farms and their fields to see the extent to which farmers follow the recommendations or use their own recommendations and what is the performance in terms of maize yield. We also, we did some soil sampling to further test um, the reflectometer in new locations. Um, Dr. Diamond Kembewa, who is a um, professor of extension at the local university, the Longway University of Agriculture and Natural Resources. He's been very engaged with parliament in Malawi, trying to show them the latest findings about extension and trying to transform extension to be more farmer oriented. So we're very excited about that policy input. You can hear some sites global change uh, science where you can learn a bit more. And so this is our ultimate goal is to support um, ag policy transformation. So policy might include extension education that goes with subsidies. Malawi is famous as a green revolution site where subsidies are getting farmer access to fertilizers. But the next step is to make sure those fertilizers are effective because we have worrying information from our surveys and from countrywide surveys that fertilizer response is not where it's supposed to be. It's very low. And so the government can spend massive amounts of money on fertilizers and farmers are happy to have the fertilizers, but if it's not translating into improved maize yields, then this is not working. And so we think that extension has to, education has to go with it. And we are supporting Dr. Diamond Kimbewa in his vision of trying to develop more participatory extension networks and using hyperlocal advice. So thanks for your time. And now I'm gonna turn it over to, and we'll have time for questions. I'm gonna turn this over to Dan Taravis, who's gonna get, for, especially for the geeks amongst you, get into the uh, intense technology aspects. But feel free to keep putting in any questions in the chat. Dan, All right, thank you, Dr. Snap. Um, yes, yeah, so I wanted to spend just a few minutes kind of peeking under the hood uh, of the processes that happen behind the scenes to develop those hyperlocal feedback mechanisms that, that Dr. Snap was talking about. Um, so first, uh, let me say, obviously out of like the seven years of research, there's a lot of insight. So when I just have two listed here, it, it's just the two that we identified has ones that we could really, focus on developing feedback and deploying feedback mechanisms in, in the field. So those were that lack of maize response um, when soil organic carbon was below a threshold level. And the threshold that, that um, Dr. Snap's team had identified was about 9.4 grams of carbon per kilogram of soil, so just under 1% carbon. And that consistent negative uh, pressure of that striga, that parasitic weed, right? So our challenge from from our size perspective was how do we codify and deliver that expert knowledge in a replicable and field deployable way? And so the first step that we needed to do was kind of define our parameters. Um, the first is that the, the farms are scattered across a wide geographic area, right? So if somebody, an extension agent is bouncing around on a motorbike for two hours to get there, we really need to make sure that they can do everything in one trip and that they don't have to run back and forth. The second is that a lot of these farms, again, very rural areas. So offline functionality is critical we couldn't expect to have any internet connectivity at all. Uh, another one is that some of the extension agents may not uh, have a very high technical literacy. I know a few of the extension agents we trained didn't have their own smartphones. Some of them did, right? You have, a, you have an age distribution of extension agents from like, you know, 25 and maybe quite tech savvy to, you know, older extension agents who this is all quite new to. 
and then that final constraint was the, um, the lack of uh, a, you know appropriately scaled soil carbon maps to get at those thresholds. So the, the tool that we use, I'll spend just a couple minutes talking about it, was the, the RSI reflectometer, which you may have heard referred to as the quick carbon tool. Um, it was used as a part of the quick carbon project at, um, at Yale University, but it wasn't the whole project. And then another use case is you may have heard of it has the real food campaign has the bionutrient meter. So those three tools are all one and the same. It is a simple 10 channel spectroscopy tool that ranges from 365 to 940 nanometers. Uh, it needs to be calibrated or all you get is that, you know, that squiggly line that you see in the graph there. And for our perspective, for this tool, the most important thing we wanted to do was predict whether or not we were over or under that threshold value. Like predicting an absolute carbon value would be really helpful. We could tell you it was 1.2% instead of 1.1, but that wasn't really the goal of the project. So the first thing that we had to do is to address that, that requirement for calibration is to uh, build the data set. And throughout the, the years of work that Dr. Snap's team had been working, we were fortunate to have a thousand soil samples with lab carbon data, GPS waypoints, yeah. uh, you know, lab-based soil texture data, everything sitting there less than 20 miles from my house, which is not usually how these projects go. So that was really exciting. Um, then we were able to, so what we did was we built a survey with the R Scikit app, which if anybody's familiar with SurveyStack, R Scikit was our first generation app and uh, data platform. Um, so we built the survey basically, someone went in, they would scan the ID on the bags that you can see here. That would pull all of the lab data from a shared, like a Google file, like a Google sheet. Then it would grab the GPS coordinates that were on the, on the Google Sheet, go up and pull all of the soil grids data that we wanted for that soil sample. So that would be percent sand, percent clay, percent silt, um, pH, cation exchange capacity, pull all of that data, add it to the data set. And then we would scan the soils with a reflectometer. So now we've got this whole set of lab data, publicly available data and spectral data to start um, playing with models. The first model that we compared was simply, let's just look at those 10 LEDs, those 10 reflection wavelengths. How well can we predict carbon? You look at the graph there, not super well, but on the other hand, it's really easy to use and it works 100% offline. The next kind of modeling approach that we looked at was to take that lab-based texture data and that um, field-generated slope data and convert those into classes, right? So sandy loam, sand, sandy clay loam, right? Something that can be captured in the field by an extension agent. Now, when we did that, the models were more accurate. It still works 100% offline, but now you've got some training required because if someone's gonna run that model in the field, they're gonna have to do that hand texturing and estimate slope classes. The third model that we went with, what did we want to try was adding that soil grids data. If we had an internet connection, instead of doing the hand texturing, can we just grab the data from the internet, pull it in, use that. Similar to the, the classes data, it was more accurate in predicting carbon, it, but it requires an internet connection and it's not so simple, to, and it's simpler to use, sorry, because you don't need to do the hand texturing. So these are kind of the three models we were evaluating. At the end, we decided to choose the one that was 100% offline, even though that would require the extension agents to do some, some hand texturing in the field. And I put a, a little note there at the top that these models for the graphs I'm showing you here, we use multiple linear regression analysis, basically because they make prettier graphs. The model that we actually used to predict over or under that threshold was a, a logistic regression, which it which doesn't make as pretty of graphs. When we tested that, it was about, we were accurate about 85% of the time when we said it was over or under that threshold. So once we had the model developed, the next step was to develop those three feedback messages that Dr. Snap talked about. One was if Striga was present, you can see them here on, on the screen. Striga was present, you know, rotate with a legume to reduce Striga before planting maize here again. 
If soil organic carbon was above that threshold, you should add fertilizer. And we put some um, examples of good timing of fertilizer application in there as well. So make sure you get some basal fertilizer planting, um, some side dress urea after planting. It's not just enough to add fertilizer. Timing is critical. And the third one was if you know, your soil carbon values were below that threshold, make sure that you, you should rehabilitate that soil, maybe plant, you know, with double up legumes or legume rotations or applying compost or manures to that field before you go the next step um, and add fertilizer again. So having done that, we, we had to build a process then that could be used by extension agents in the field. So again, we used uh, our, our, the app and software platform to build uh, a survey and to build a script to provide the appropriate feedback. And then we trained extension agents on how to use both the app and how to do the hand texturing of soils. You can see here a group of extension agents um, practicing with their hand texturing in the field. And then each extension agent went out and visited three fields. And one of the lucky parts of this project, we, we were able to go out in the dry season. Anybody who's familiar with spectroscopy for predicting soil carbon, soil moisture can be um, a real hindrance. So being able to go at the tail end of the dry season where moisture wasn't a factor really helped the, the infield processes. This is just a, an example of some of the questions that the, that the extension agents would walk through with the, the farmers at each field. So they would go to the first field and they would ask questions like, was, you know, Striga present in this field in the last year? What was the slope uh, of the field? And here you see a set of questions, if anybody's familiar with the, with the standard decision tree for hand texturing soil, right? Does the soil remain in a ball? Does it form a ribbon? How long is the ribbon? Those kind of uh, basic questions. We could use that to determine soil texture. The soil, the, the extension agents would take a soil sample in the field down to about 20 centimeters. They would homogenize it. Half would go for hand texturing. The other half, they would break up clods, use the spectrometer, the reflectometer to take measurement. And then after they had done all three fields, so they, they've now got scans and hand texturing and everything for three fields. Then they would go, you know, maybe sit under a shade tree, you know, near their home or wherever. Then they would run a final model that would generate the soil organic carbon predictions for each field. You can see that in the little output here on the right. You can tell this is an older generation software that is an ugly um, UI, but the message is clear, right? It's got the, the name of the field as given by the farmer at the top gives you the recommendation and it provides at the bottom some information with Straga present, yes or no, what was the estimated carbon value. So we would output that recommendation for each of the three fields. And then the final piece of recommendation that we provided was to rank the relative carbon values in each of those three fields. So you may be in a situation where all three of your fields were above or below that threshold, in which case just telling you whether above or below isn't helpful. So we wanted to be able to go one step farther and say, okay, well, if you have limited resources and you can only do it for one field, this is the field with the, with the greatest carbon um, estimation. So maybe this is where you should put that carbon. And I think as Dr. Snap alluded to earlier, just the, the act of going through the fields, taking the soil sample, doing the hand texturing, that really helped um, feedback from the extension agents during these training sessions is that really helped facilitate that conversation about soil carbon and about soil health because it wasn't an abstract concept while you're sitting under shade tree talking about it you went out you ran the soil through your fingers um, and, and so the last thing that I wanted to mention um, so the app worked with the extension agents everything was hundred percent offline you know they didn't need connectivity but at the end of every day when they got home or somewhere where they had connection they could go ahead and upload that data to the database. We had a visualization dashboard that would immediately get updated with those results, which means that a research team that was in three countries, the US, uh, Zimbabwe, where Dr. Koo was based in Malawi, can all in real time will happen, right? The new points show up on the map, the, you know, in, you can see here, there's a histogram of soil carbon, predicted soil carbon values based on the recommendations that were provided. So that would get updated, the number of recommendations by type, you know, rotate, 
fertilizer, no fertilizer, would all get updated in real time, which really made it easier for distributed groups to conduct and manage research. And with that, I will turn it over for questions. Thanks so much, Dan and Sig. Um, I, uh, there are a lot in the chat. Um, I'm gonna sort of prompt uh, one to start. Uh, Keith asked about land PKS and I, I thought maybe you might uh, sort of uh, take that on as well because there are certainly elements that were incorporated from land PKS incorporated into the survey stack or pre-survey stack. <laughs> Um, but maybe you want to just talk a little bit about sort of, and I get sort of at uh, also sort of what's next. What are you gonna? What what are the some of the capabilities that you'll be able to add uh, to that, that you see coming in the next uh, in the next seasons? And Keith, you can certainly add more. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I mean, certainly it's a low cost option. I, I was, I, I've been interested to, to try that myself for some time, but never had the chance. So any experience you've had comparing it with um, the land PKS color thing would be very interesting. Um, just wanted to make uh, perhaps another comment while I have the floor, and that was the comparison with digital soil mapping. And I mean, this is the problem we see with all digital soil mapping is you kind of get the regression towards the mean problem in that it squashes the variability on the top and bottom ends, which is the precisely the things you need to know. Um, and in cases like this, where you have thresholds, so this is where sensors really come in uh, to co to complement something like that. So it's great to see see this work. Uh, I did have a question. Um, you, know, you you've got a fairly limited wavelength range there, um, so perhaps it worked well because of the mineralogy. Um, in this area, um, how much experience have you had trying in you know very different soil types, different mineralogies, and how well the calibrations may hold up in different settings? Um, and how how sort of local was it to to the textures and mineralogy of the area, kind of thing? Yeah. Yeah, no, that, that's a great question. And so we have we understand that we're making this trade off, right? We have ten wavelengths, so it's very restricted compared to you know full spec. There's this ease of data analysis and and, and use, and then the, the cost aspects that kind of have drive those decision makings. What we've decided, um, at least in our use so far, is that we want to focus more on local calibrations. If we can make it easy for someone to replicate the process that I just laid out then we don't have to worry about you know someplace with vastly different mineralogies having that same calibration work i think when you get to these larger thousands of dollars spectrometers it really makes sense to have a, a global calibration you want it to work everywhere out of the box um, we would love to get there at some point but we're realistic that let's start with a bunch of more localized calibrations where we can better control the, the, the circumstances to begin with and let's build up towards that more global calibration later. Yeah, my, my worry would be is if, if you're picking up kind of um, iron oxide, you know, based things in the visible range in this particular set of circumstances, but if you've got sort of one to one, two to one clay, uh, you know, driving the the, the sock um, in other settings, whether you're picking that up still in the, the ranges that you're using or whether you'd completely miss that if you went to a a different setting that would be my concern yeah yeah but to be tested i think yeah if i could just come in on the lamp ks i see herrick's um jeff herrick is here yay uh so we who is the father of the lamp guess so just this idea of lamp potential for those of you who don't know check it out lamppotential.org you can dig it encourages people to dig holes and, and think more holistically about their soil, so to speak. Um, for from a, a there's a number of different modules, but we've particularly been using the soil module on it. And um, we have it about a hundred sites where we have all the different types of information from the reflectometer, from uh, full lab characterization of pedology and, and soil carbon and their soil properties. And so we're continuing to explore that even in, in Niger, so other countries, Tanzania, um, and we really see value in both types of approaches um, in terms of this uh, in Malawi circumstance where we really think that soil carbon is 
such a driver of, of soil health and of, of response to fertilizer. There may be other locations where you really need that um, understanding of soil uh, rooting depth, of laterite layers or other types of things that LAMP PKS can give you more insights into. Um, so we think they're complementary and, and two important approaches. So trying to get local information, as Keith said, is, is often important. And we also wanted to point out that, um, that you know, we're, okay, texture tells you something. Back in the day with just trying to come up with soil fertility um, test kits, we called them, um, we would encourage farmers to texture. And we think that's really important. It's used both in Lampicus and in this, in this uh, reflectometer. But the problem is we wanna support farmers who have managed to improve carbon for their texture. So it's harder to improve soil carbon, much harder if you have a sandy site, but we want to know if you've managed to do that. And so that's where the reflectometer really helps you do that. So texture and general where you are in the world. So the, the parent mineralogy gets you so far, but we also want some sort of feedback through visual light or if um, spectral feedback on have you managed to improve your soil carbon. And so we think we have an example now where we've managed to do that, at least for these soil types. So we're pretty excited about that. Great, thanks, uh, Sig. I saw another question from uh, Steve um, uh, with uh, Tech Matters about uh, the, the, whether the soil grids data was too large or what the considerations were for sort of locally caching certain uh, texture libraries. But I'm, I'm also wanted to maybe extend that to spectral libraries uh, as well in terms of what, what the considerations are uh, in terms of, uh, terms of the device or, or whatnot. Maybe to... Dan? Yeah. Yeah. Dan. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Um, you know, I don't think we would have had the capacity to do that with our you know, with our old platform and app. One of the things that we are working on, um, on on a separate but related project with the ESMC for kind of stratification is the ability to then prefetch map layers if you know generally where you're going so that you have that data available. So I think that's something that may be available, you know, within the next year or two where we can prefetch. You don't want to, you know, fetch the entire database on the app, but if, if we have a better idea of, of local, um, local tiles, we can prefetch. And you, would you, would you extend that to spectral libraries as well as texture? I guess that's the question. I guess what's your, your thought in terms of, uh, approaches uh, there. I mean, certainly this, these, one of the dynamics that we talk a lot about in Open Team is that a lot of these techniques uh, improve with local uh, calibration. Um, and so uh, I, maybe talk a little bit about the approaches for how that kind of data could then be uh, 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 hosted or accessed as, as we move forward with uh, again, improved local libraries, even as we're drawing on some of these larger sort of global texture or spectral. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm not exactly sure what you mean about storing the, the spectral libraries. Sorry. Oh, yeah. On the device. Device. I'm, I'm talking about device storage. Again, just uh, and feel free to redirect. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 it's yeah. fine. I it's not, it sounds way too data intensive. Remember a lot of these <laughs> extension you know they're using very inexpensive phones and very <laughs> as inexpensive as we can um, devices so i think there may be intermediate users like researchers that that make me more sense for right well, but I, i'm not quite following because i yeah. it just seems that that's the type of level i mean to me the next product would be some sort of maps i put in the chat I, I would like to hear if anyone has, uh, I think that it would be useful for, for, for communities to have this information, not just individual farmers, particularly since a lot of soil conservation occurs at the community level. You can't just put in a bund and then have it spill all the erosion <laughs> into the next farm. It has to be community decision-making. So has anyone gotten this type of hyper-local information back to the communities? I know that land use planning is being done some through land PKS, but, but generating products that could be used locally, I, I haven't seen that. And I'm not sure spectral libraries is, I don't think more like Yeah, maps. that was sort of a 
a proxy sig thanks for redirecting i was really thinking sort of more of that sort of that local data yeah thanks does anyone have experience with that because we'd really like to that's i think one of the next directions that we'd like to see happen but we have not yet i mean we have the maps that you saw and in papers but how to get those right back to communities it would be really interesting i think for even farmers in the u.s yeah, I don't have experience with that, but I, that seems like a great idea. Jeff, I'm wondering if you want to jump in. Um, yeah, I don't have a, a lot to add. I mean, uh, Sieg's point about um, storage capacity and, and sort of understanding the limitations of the phones and even just syncing, even in the United States. You know, a lot of our farmers and ranchers are working in areas where they may not have good cell signal. And so being able to rely on that. So I think the model that um, they just demonstrated, that Dan demonstrated here is a really nice one because it basically maximizes the capacity that we do have to do things in the field. And similar to what we were trying to do with land PKS, where we calculate available water holding capacity in the field. We allow you to determine texture in the field. Um, we do everything that you can, but don't try to do things in the field that just aren't going to be realistic, except for the people with the latest iPhone, um, I, I think is, is, is key. And I think the other thing, just while I've got the floor here, um, when we're making these comparisons between field determinations of texture, soil grids determinations, and determinations from the older soil maps, um, it's really important to recognize that which is going to give you the best prediction depends on who you are, meaning how well you can field texture yourself, and where you are, meaning the relative accuracy and precision of each of those different soil map products. And we've got several different studies that will be coming out um, now in Namibia, uh, comparing the, the different approaches um, and in, um, uh, in Ghana uh, with fairly large data sets. And, and basically what it shows is that, you know, it, it really does depend. Um, and so it's just, you know, it's almost always, if you're out in the field, it's almost always worth grabbing some soil and at least just feeling it to, you know, so that you can say, yeah, this was not a clay. This was clearly not a clay, even though the map said it was a clay. Or, yeah, this feels exactly like a clay, and, and you know, I'm going to go with that. Um, so that's, I, I think, continuing, and, and Keith um, is the leader, a thought leader, on figuring out what information is going to add the most value to our decision, is going to increase um, the, the accuracy of our determination or decision. Um, and so this whole idea of information value and so forth is something that, that I think we really need to be pushing for because um, right now we're trying to tell people, oh yeah, you should do this based on global averages or you should determine you know, slope because that's the best predictor of, of erosion globally. Well, it is globally, but it may not be your location. Mm -hmm. So Jeff, you're the leader of getting us down and dirty and digging holes, and now you want us feeling that text. It's <laughs> great. This is great to have these thought leaders today. So appreciate it, your time. So I've got another question, Sig, because we often come down to sort of the social context of this of this process in the field too, and I know that we have some advances now with survey stack coming. Uh, maybe if you could just the Dan, both of you might just talk a little bit about uh, your approaches to how uh, this co-creation of these tools and use in the field, uh, you know, has unfolded. This sort of techno-social interaction, and then any thoughts or observations you have in terms of what's really crucial or uh, what, uh, yeah. I, I guess I'll, I'll leave it up to you to just <laughs> to go with that. <laughs> Okay, I'll just come in first, just as a user uh, side of it, I just want to say it's uh, really amazing to, to have gotten to work with uh, our shy and Jeff's group too, that because they're both very user oriented. 
So we can say, look, this just, you say it works in the field, but it actually is not working in the field. And that's just fundamentally different from working with other tech where we're just told this is, you know, the really cool Dan's, you know, <laughs> spectral and I should just use Dan's and not try and say, no, it needs to be co-created that it needs to, to, to work in the hot humid tropics. It needs to uh, work with that connectivity. So I just really appreciate having um, this community now that's really farmer oriented. And then also a shout out to Damien Kimbewa and the local university, because he is, he's always been about farmer oriented extension. And there's just so few examples of where we've actually seen changes in technologies options recommended. Often we still are, I think in our heads have this researcher extension extending farmer orientation. And so, you know, I, today I didn't talk about some of the technologies, but um, finding that we need different options, that, that um, it's not just all about about tech, it's really listening to farmers that, you know, Striga makes this huge difference that um, Vicky Maroney is on this too, just recently is really emphasizing that there's a local compost plus fertilizer product that farmers are using, we should be paying attention to that. So we need to make sure that our options as well as the tech are farmer oriented and um, need local, um, you know, fine tuning so that we can provide some options locally and then see how farmers adapt them. So I just wanna emphasize that it's a whole part of this process and that that it's always been a slow process because we record things, but then it takes a long time and we often don't necessarily record them perfectly. And now it's speeding up that process has, has been a huge benefit to the whole communication, but it really takes having um, geeks, engineers that are willing to help us in this. And I saw it just, appreciate from the bottom of my heart this um, open team approach and especially our side. Yeah, and, and I would just like to add to that. We, I mean, at our side, I think there's two projects, this this project with, with MSU and Dr. Snap and also the Real Food Campaign. We're lucky in that we are in many ways the end user of our own product, which means we don't build something, ship it off. And then when somebody complains about it, we're like, well, whatever, right? Like all of those complaints come directly to us. So it really focuses, it really forces us to have a really human centered design. What is the in-field experience, right? I was there with, with the extension agents when they were going through the training and, it, and it's, so I can see what they're doing. I can see where they're struggling. And so that that's always been one of our, our, our critical components of our design is, is we want to be the, in some ways, the first user of it so that we know when we pass it off um you know it, it's going to work maybe not for everybody but for the majority of users the, the design the process the flow will will work thanks dan it looks like we've got a uh question from pauline i can read yeah it. i see that in the chat about um how variable, and thanks Pauline, so great to see you, old friend from Zim, Babu, back in the day. Um, the based on your experiences in the farmer's field, how variable has texture and organic matter been within the same field? So you can see, I think, um, even from those um, frequencies that Dan and I put up, different types of them, and maybe those maps, you saw the different colors, that, that organic matter varies very much within a farm, for sure, right? We were trying to assess for a particular field and these fields are very small. They're not even half a hectare. They're often, they're almost plots um, in some cases. So we're, we're talking, you know, a farmer may say it's a quarter acre, but in fact, it's even smaller when you have the borders you can see around behind me, this what's seen as a field. So within them, they maybe are often managed um, the same. And so these small plots or fields um, have fairly consistent organic matter, but across a farm, dramatic variation. And that's why we think it should be field specific, that at least particularly for smaller farmers that we, we need more hyper-local information, at least as a next step. That'd be my thought. Dan, what do you think? Yeah, no, I, I think that's right. Uh, if I could jump in, I, I'd certainly agree um, very much so with Seek. Um, and I, this is something that's fascinated me for my entire career and, and been all over the world. And frequently we can predict how much texture is going to vary 
based on where we are in the landscape. So if we are on a big flat alluvial plain, odds are, oddly, the texture is going to vary a lot because alluvial plain means that rivers have been dumping sediment and sometimes they dump clay and sometimes sand and sometimes silt. And on our very small pecan farm in the southwest United States, the texture varies all over the place within much less than a hectare. And, and it has very significant implications for irrigation scheduling and, and so forth. Um, whereas if you're on a landscape where the wind has deposited sediment, you can go for miles and miles and miles and miles and kilometers and thousands of kilometers, not thousands, but hundreds of kilometers certainly, um, and not change texture. Botswana is a good example. And texture being one of the primary drivers of soil organic matter then gives you your first hint about how much soil organic matter is gonna vary within that field or within that farm. And then the next question you ask is, has management been consistent across this field? And are there topographic differences that might have changed how much water has accumulated or run off within that landscape? So you can actually learn, literally, if, if you know, we get on the, a, a, a call together and I ask somebody to share where they are, I'll immediately get it on Google Earth. And you can predict a huge amount about how much local variability there's going to be at the field scale, just knowing what the landscape context is. Yeah, and I think we need to be using that more in agronomy, that um, the micro topography we see a lot of uh, in Michigan, for example, um, it, it really drives yield potential. You're seeing that with the yield monitors. And often paramaterial is used to come up with, with uh, subregions within a field because these fields are more, you know, they're medium sized, I would say, being originally from out west where, you know, quarter sections, but here in Michigan, maybe 50 acres and such. And so there's, there's this micro topography where on the top of a slope, um, and then there's the slope, and then there's the little micro depressional areas. And it depends on the year too, right? But our recommendation should be more around in a cold, wet year, you know, really be careful about your depressional areas. And then in a hot, dry year, um, you probably will get more yield from those areas. And so maybe, I mean, one of the challenges cover crops often do really well in the high organic matter parts of our fields. And yet we have these sandy knolls that where we need the organic matter to be built up and cover crops don't grow well there. So maybe we need to do precision agricultural compost, for example. So there is need to be a lot more attention to this um, micro, um, hyperlocal, in my view, texture and then its implications for soil carbon. So thanks for sharing that. It's a really good point about alluvial plains. Well, I wanna thank everybody for, for joining here. It's really exciting to see another piece of this uh, of our uh, shared toolkit to uh, for our data-driven story sharing and uh, this sort of more participatory uh, approach at this hyper-local level. Uh, so um, with that, I'd like to hand it off to Laura to close us out. Yes, thank you again, Dr. Snap and Dr. Travis. And for everyone for joining today, just to note that in two weeks, our next in-depth will have SIBO Technologies presenting. Uh, so SIBO is focused on providing insights at the field level, uh, yield predictions, greenhouse gas estimates through uh, a number of technologies that they stack uh, with remote sensing. Uh, so join us again in a couple of weeks and uh, thanks everyone for joining this in depth. Thanks again for the yeah, very, very interesting. Thank you. Here.